Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar. My name is uh, Daniel Franco from Rupert Consult here in Cologne, Germany, and I will be moderating today. Uh, I'd like to say that this webinar is organized by the Suda Satellite and Coexist projects, both of which are Horizon 2020 projects and have joined efforts to reach out to stakeholders all around uh, Europe and the world. And we're very happy to have received such a high level of interest today uh, with over 150 registrations prior to the event. So far, we can see that 56, 57 participants have uh, joined us already and uh, we're, we're sure that uh, many more will do so through the course of the webinar. And uh, so the, today we will learn about um, the automation ready transport modeling functionalities that have been developed within Coexist. And we will address the challenge of including connected and automated vehicles in traffic flow and in travel demand simulations. Before we start, I would like to um, explain a bit about the functionalities of our webinar system. If you have any problem with the audio, please note that um, you also have the option of dialing in. Just click on the phone call uh, option in the audio setting and choose a number from the list of countries that are available. Now, this is the GoToWebinar toolbar. All participants are muted as a default setting to avoid any background noises, but you have the chance of raising your hand uh, if you have any comment or uh, questions and we can unmute you then. The raising your hand button you can find uh, uh, with the little hand and, and a green arrow. Um, but uh, please do remember to, to uh, mute, mute yourself again after you post your question uh, during the Q&A session. There's also a question box uh, where you can send us your doubts, your questions throughout the event. One of my colleagues will monitor and record them and post them during the Q&A session. And you can also contact us about any technical difficulties or doubts you might have. There will also be some handouts uh, available, but before that, uh, just some instructions about the um, questions. Um, you can use the question box featured at any time. Um, we will have two moments uh, where, where questions are going to be taken, so three to five minutes session after each presentation. And there will also be a 10-minute open discussion at the end of the webinar. And I was, uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, you will also find handouts available for download, including this introductory and audience guide presentation and some other documents uh, from Coexist. This is the webinar team, uh, Daniel Franco, myself, I'm moderating, and my colleague, Regina Govender, she's uh, handling the questions and polls that we will have throughout the event. And we have a great set of presenters for today. Uh, Peter Sukenik from PTV Group and Jörg Sonleitner from the University of Stuttgart, um, both partners at the Coexist project. Now on the webinar structure, after this brief introduction, we will hear from Peter on microscopic traffic flow simulation and then from Jörg related to microscopic travel demand modeling finalizing with the open discussion and wrap up as I was just mentioning. Now we have decided to invite to this webinar because we do see um, a great need for tools to be developed and allow for an automation ready transport and infrastructure planning um, connection with this automated mobility topic and technology. This is, uh, we believe, a key precondition to enabling and fulfilling the promises that CAV uh, poses on reducing road space demand, improved traffic efficiency and safety. But what do we mean with uh, automation ready? Within Coexist, we have defined this as the capability 
of making structured and informed decisions about the deployment of cooperative, connected, and automated mobility. So it's very much in line with the strategic aim of the project of bridging the gap between the technology and transportation and infrastructure planning, of strengthening capacities for urban authorities and cities to effectively address this challenge. And to do so, Coexist has a three-step approach and modeling is a cornerstone of this approach. The first uh, step, as you can see, automation-ready transport modeling. Uh, within this project, we have then developed uh, functionalities that allow for the consideration of um, automated vehicles within both microscopic traffic flow and microscopic travel demand models, um, including different types of CAVs and for different automation levels. We also work together with road infrastructure, uh, road authorities, and we're assessing the um, impacts that uh, CAVs have on road infrastructure in, in our partner cities. And these are the other two steps of our approach. And for this, I would like to also take the chance to invite you to join us again next year for the next webinar, which we will look at the results of this um, implementation within Coexist uh, Partner Cities. We will look into the assessment of the impact they've had on road infrastructure. This is yet to be scheduled, but it should happen uh, around March or April 2020. And I would like to recommend you to um, subscribe to our latest news and events by going to our website. This way you won't miss any of the events that we are uh, promoting. And if you want to learn more from Coexist, you are also encouraged to visit our YouTube channel by going through this link. You can find all the previously held webinars, um, an introduction to connected, to connected and automated driving, which was held last year. Maybe some of you also joined us back then. And more detailed webinars on uh, PTV Visim and Visum softwares and how uh, you can use them to model automated vehicles. I would also like to take this opportunity to invite you to uh, engage with us to let us know your opinion on CCAM by replying to our survey, going through this link. The survey is still gonna be open for a little while longer and it's a very important uh, input for our uh, work in Coexist and the conclusions that we're um, getting to. And to also let you know that uh, the project's final conference is happening, happening next year in Milton Keynes uh, by the end of March. So please save the date and we'll be very happy if some of you can join us there. We will have also a training on the tools that are being developed in Coexist. So please make sure to keep an eye out uh, for this uh, event. And before we go then for the next presentation uh, with Peter, I would like to get to know a bit about uh, who has joined us today. We see now 74 attendees actually. Uh, let's hear from your side what your um, occupation, your background is. Sidrina, if you can please open the first poll. Sure thing. All right, you should now be able to see it. Um, that's the second one. But let's also hear from your side. When do you expect uh, automated vehicles to be available on your city? Um, this is um, always very interesting to, to hear because uh, from the different backgrounds that uh, participants have, we've learned in our different events and, and sessions, um, the expectations can be quite different and uh, it is very interesting to see what you expect from automated mobility. Okay. All right, I'm seeing quite a few people have answered, so I'm going to open up your for questions. Okay. 
Okay, I think we have 83% right. now, yes. Yep. I'm just gonna close the poll, everybody, if you wanna have the last few seconds to answer. All right. So we should be able to see the results of the poll. Mm -hmm. As you can see, there's uh, quite a quite a mix, but most of you think that it's gonna be after 2040 or after 2050. Um, okay, that's interesting, good to know. Um, All right, shall I move on to the first question? Yes, the first question, we can go back to that one. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so here uh, I would like to, like I was saying before, learn about your uh, occupation and background, whether you are representing a public authority, whether you're a consultant, uh, maybe you work on a transport operator or mobility service provider, researchers, industry, or uh, if you have any other background, please also let us know in the question box. Hmm. All right, just the last couple of seconds. All right. Great, thank you. Um, okay, that's also uh, quite a diverse group we have today with a large number of researchers and, and university um, staff. Um, also, we have participants from the industry, uh, public authorities, and consultants and advisors. So, a very diverse group. This is uh, uh, very valuable from our side as well to reach out to different groups of stakeholders. So, thank you for being here today. And uh, without further uh, ado, we would like to welcome uh, Peter Sukanik from PTV. Uh, he will um, let us know about the functionalities that have been developed and coexist on microscopic traffic flow simulation. So, um, welcome, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So now you should see my screen, right? Yes, we do. Thanks. Perfect. So, hello everyone. Uh, this is Peter from PDB Karlsruhe and with me, uh, my colleague uh, Lucas Couch uh, is here and he will help me to answer your questions later. I will present to you new developments in PTV VSIM related to Coexist project and related to the microscopic modeling of automated vehicles. I will start with uh, the recapitulation of features we already presented and which were included uh, in uh, VSIM 11 already. The first one, enforce absolute braking distance, an ultimate safety requirement that is applicable for rail safe and cautious driving behavior. It is based on brick wall stop distance uh, principle. Next one is use implicit stochastic on by default to mimic the human behavior can be switched off for automated vehicles. Number of interaction vehicles. Now you can distinguish between vehicles and objects and simulate sensor limitations. For example, the vehicle can see only uh, the preceding vehicle. In that case, uh, you can set the, the number of interaction vehicles to one and the number of interaction uh, objects to a higher value so the vehicle still can see uh, a signal head ahead. Increased acceleration, a vehicle class can accelerate over the desired value if needed, for example, to maintain tight the following of automated vehicles. Gap time, 
based on leading vehicle class, you can set different gaps and standstill distances based on the leading uh, vehicle class. Consider vehicles in dynamic potential. Pedestrians can actively look for gaps to cross between vehicles standing or slowly driving. So this is important for the interaction between vehicles and pedestrians in uh, shared space areas or uh, similar uh, areas. Then zero passengers for automated vehicles, occupancy distribution with zero passengers are uh, now available. And open drive import, import basic uh, network objects like link and connectors from open drive files. If you are interested into details, so please have a look on our previous webinar. Daniel mentioned it uh, already. You can just click on the link and uh, watch uh, the recording. The next one I want to talk about uh, is driving behaviors. You know that uh, since VSIM 11, we have uh, three additional driving behaviors uh, in VSIM uh, per default, cautious, normal, and aggressive based on uh, Coexist uh, project. And these new driving behaviors have uh, modified parameters, uh, which are based uh, on uh, the driving uh, behavior concept. This was developed by Adriano Alessandrini for the Coexist project and describes four fundamental driving behaviors, rail safe, cautious, normal, and all knowing. The first one, rail safe, we didn't implement it into Wisdom. That's a very special one, but we implemented cautious and normal. And um, the last one, all knowing, we call it uh, inside Wisdom aggressive because it's better described what it, uh, what Vision can do, uh, and we, we still call it all knowing within Coexist project because it assume um, a more complex uh, and higher level of uh, communication and cooperation. And the modified parameters are based also on empirical data. Well, we collected on the test truck in Helmond. We collected mostly uh, the data from following process, not from a lane changing process. And the parameters are based also on results from uh, car simulations and the car simulation data was uh, produced by PDV and Vedicom when we have uh, different uh, control uh, driving logic uh, used in, uh, in a simulation. And of course, uh, we made some assumptions, uh, especially for lane changing. This one is new, implemented in Wisim 2020. It's called lane specific driving behavior, which means now uh, a link behavior type can be assigned to a lane and it overrides the link behavior type. So if you define a specific driving behavior for each lane on your link, this will be applied for vehicles driving on this uh, lane. If you don't fill uh, any values here in the link dialog uh, for the lanes, the driving behavior uh, of the link will be used. The next big feature is platooning. Under platoon, we understand a group of connected vehicles traveling very closely and safely together, also at uh, high speeds. The, the use case we implemented it for is the simulation of effects on general traffic. And there is no special simulation of platoon internals or of the internal dynamic inside or of the vehicle dynamic inside a platoon and we developed this feature in a way that there is a stable driving within the platoon and there are also a few new driving behavior attributes available you can set this feature 
uh, can be set vehicle class specific. So you can let only cars to build platoons or um, only AGVs with AGVs, or you can have a mixed platoons. So you as a modeler can decide. You can have platooning also only in one or a few lanes on your link. I mentioned the lane uh, specific driving behavior. You can set uh, on a link for each lane and you can use it, for example, to have a platooning only on one link. A few words about platoon life essentials. Joining uh, the platoon, a vehicle can join platoon from behind, not from the side. So the platoon will not make space and allow to join a vehicle from the side, from another uh, lane. So only a vehicle from behind, which is driving in the same lane, can join the platoon. And a platoon can be created only by vehicles using the same driving behavior. Uh, platooning is not available for uh, public transport vehicles and not for vehicles on a parking uh, routes. There are five new uh, parameters you can set for platooning. The first one, maximum number of vehicles in a platoon. Then the maximum desired speed you can set, uh, which will be used uh, by the platoon. So if a vehicle with, uh, with a desired speed 130 will create uh, a platoon as a leader, then it will uh, adapt the speed to the maximum uh, desired speed if the desired speed of the platoon is lower, uh, let's say one, 100 or something like that. Um, the platoon will drive with the desired speed of the leader of the platoon if this speed is not higher as the maximum desired speed of the platoon. The next uh, parameter you can set is the maximum distance for catching up to a platoon. And a um, vehicle can join a platoon uh, in the front only if, if uh, the speed of the vehicle is uh, at least a little bit uh, higher than the speed uh, of the platoon uh, in the front. Uh, you can set the gap time in uh, seconds and the minimum clearance. So you can set uh, how big the distance is uh, by dri uh, when driving uh, in, in platoon will be. The driving uh, itself, uh, the platoon cannot change the lane. So the platoon can continue only in the lane and if there is a need for lane change because of the route, for example, then mm, the platoon will dissolve. If there is only one vehicle in the platoon or a few vehicles in the platoons or which need to change the lane, then these vehicles will leave the platoon in order to perform the lane change. Um, the vehicles Within the platoon, they keep the same uh, distance, uh, which is uh, speed dependent, of course, and uh, there is some kind of limited acceleration uh, change uh, built in. There is a change of parameters possible during driving. So if a platoon will drive from one link to another link, the other link can, have, uh, can use another driving behavior also for platooning, different values for platooning. So after the platoon will reach uh, the second link, it will adapt to new parameters. And uh, the platoon can split if uh, there is a reason for that. For example, if uh, there is a red signal, it might happen that uh, part of the platoon uh, need to stop in front of uh, of the signal and only the only the first part of the platoon can continue on green signal and so there will, there will be two platoons one platoon will be continue and uh, the second platoon will stop at front uh, of the signal 
A few words about leaving the platoon. If a vehicle needs to leave the platoon because of the route, for example, because vehicles can form a platoon only if the routes uh, uh, overlap. And if, if the vehicle needs to change the lane, for example, then it needs to leave the platoon and the distance before and behind this vehicle will be increased and then the vehicle will perform uh, the maneuver. So the, the platoon will split. A few words about platoon stability. Each platoon has a platoon leader, the first vehicle in the platoon. And the last vehicle in the platoon, this one proceeds to keep defined gap time or clearance to preceding vehicle. Where while the acceleration of this last vehicle is limited to the acceleration of the leader plus minus two meters per square second. And the platoon members, these are distributed equally. So the distances between vehicles are same. And as I mentioned already, there is uh, no simulation of some communication processes itself, no packet sending or dealing with latency uh, like uh, uh, in, a, in a real world uh, with real uh, hardware. This is the way uh, we implemented it in order to achieve uh, a stable behavior within the platoon without uh, escalating uh, acceleration values or some unrealistic values. Next part is a demo. So let me show you a few examples directly in VSIM. So here I started the simulation and you can see vehicles driving in and uh, building platoons. Let me explain the colors of uh, vehicles. The dark blue is the leader of the platoon and the light blue is the platoon member. Vehicles with, uh, with the dark uh, black color, they are not in the platoon. And the, this visualization is based on the value of one a uh, new attribute, vehicle attribute, which is called indexed in a platoon. And if you would like to achieve uh, this, the, this kind of color evaluation, uh, you can set to the drawing mode to use color scheme and as a co in, into a color scheme configuration, you need to pick up index in platoon and then choose a color uh, you like uh, for platoons. As you can see here, there are different vehicles within one platoon, cars together with uh, AGVs. Why is that? Because if you have a look on a link behavior type list, for freeway, I'm using here in this example, uh, freeway driving behavior, number three, as a default. And for two vehicle classes, which uh, you can see here and in a coupled uh, list for a car platoon and AGV platoon, they use driving behavior uh, for automated vehicles. And I said the same driving behavior for both these uh, vehicle classic. And that's why they can build uh, they can be in a, in a one platoon, these two vehicle classes. So now I stop the simulation and I will change four cars to another one, to aggressive, for example, and start the simulation again. And you will see that uh, the AGV will not join the platoon of cars. So there are platoons of cars and there might be also platoons of uh, AGVs like you can see here. So 
this black vehicle can join a platoon, this one not because it's different vehicle type. So this is a simple way um, how to how to have a platooning. Uh, let me show you the new tab in driving behavior. On the tab autonomous driving, uh, you can allow platooning in your model. And here you can set the five parameters I talked about. Okay, let me switch to another example. Here I let a few vehicles to drive in into my network and again the dark blue color means this is my leader, platoon leader, and the light blue uh, are uh, platoon members. And uh, the past best possibility or the easiest way how to form a platoon is to let the, the vehicles to stop at the uh, the front of the of the signal and then when the platoon drives through the network it comes to a moment where a vehicle this one this black one left the platoon because this vehicle will need to change the lane because we'll leave the motorway here so you can see that the distances to the preceding vehicle is increased and also the distance to the vehicle behind increased and then the vehicle can simply leave the network and the two new platoons can continue driving and later they can become a one platoon again here in my case, in my network, they need to stop because of a signal again, and they will form a one platoon again. Then this platoon continues through the network, and it can happen in the network that only a few vehicles from the platoon will make it on the green signal, and some of them need to stop. So this last vehicle, will not make it on uh, green or yellow, so we'll stop. This platoon of four vehicles will continue through the network and will approach unsignalized intersection and can happen that a vehicle will leave the platoon like this first one and we have a new platoon of three vehicles behind because this first vehicle can make it through the intersection but the rest of the platoon need to wait to give a priority to this vehicle and then the platoon will continue if there is a gap. And at the end of my example the vehicles need to make a lane change which means they will leave the platoon the platoon is dissolved now you can see it on a black color and then later they can make they can create platoons again okay i have one more example to show this is an example of the Helmond network and this example will be a part of the installation later, I think in the service spec number four. It's not in the example directory yet, but it will be added soon. When I start the simulation here, then you can see uh, vehicles filling the network, approaching uh, the signals in a 2D on the left and in a 3D on the right. And again, I'm using the same color for platoons and the leaders of the platoons are also telling I'm the leader. Uh, this 
with it you bit using 3D information signs showing this value. And on this example, I would like to show you how you can evaluate the platooning in a simple way. Here in this chart, you can see the number of vehicles in a platoon in the network in this first column. Then you can see number of platoons in the network. And then you can see number of platoons of specific size platoons of the size of two vehicles, three, four, up to up to eight vehicles. And this is showing dynamically uh, the, the, the state uh, in the simulation. And this is done uh, by using a simple script. I will just show the script. So it's, it's, it's quite simple and it's using the, attribute, the vehicle attribute index in a platoon to calculate the number of platoons and the number of platoons of specific uh, size in an easy way. And this script is saving this information into a user-defined attributes. And this chart shows these user-defined attributes. And this will be also uh, part of the example later. So now I will go back to my presentation. I have one more slide to show. We have some new vehicle attributes in VSIM 2020. The first one is safety distance, not, which is the desired safety distance, front to rear. Then clearance, the distance to the leading vehicle, front to rear, and following distance, net, the distance to the relevant interaction objects, front to rear. You might know that we have a similar attributes for a long time uh, inside VSIM, uh, which are gross, uh, which we chose gross uh, values, uh, front to front. But the, now, these attributes are available, making it easier to examine or debug your model. And also you might need to save these uh, values for post-processing. Uh, and you, do not, you don't need to subtract uh, the length of previous vehicle and you can save some, some memory. That was all from my side. And uh, if you have questions, then I'm ready to answer or my colleague, Lucas. Thank you, Peter, for the very interesting presentation. Yes, we do have a couple of questions um, on, the, on, the, on the chat now. So let's uh, first uh, go to a question by Fernando Torres. Um, he asks whether Platoons can be set only for specific vehicle classes. Yes, yes, you can define a driving behavior which will be used only by your vehicle class you define or uh, for by um, several vehicle classes you define. So you can have a copy of uh, uh, existing vehicle class, uh, conventional class, you can make a copy and say this is uh, my class for automated vehicles and uh, you can allow uh, forming platooning only for this vehicle class by uh, you by letting using uh, a special driving behavior by this class. Great, thank you. Okay, and uh, we also have um, a question by uh, Ermal Silimani. Um, asking whether we can explain again why platoons are so important. Why are we focusing on them uh, during this presentation? Mm, because we expect that in a, in a future there will be platoons on the roads and our software, we wanted to make our software AV ready 
including uh, allowing uh, simulate platooning and all other features which are available for uh, automated vehicles uh, we presented already in the previous webinar and this one uh, was focused on platooning because platooning is the new thing which is available for automated vehicles uh, in uh, WSM 2020 including lane specific uh, behavior and um, actually right now there are some uh, research programs and some pilots programs where vehicles are tested already on a real infrastructure driving uh, in platoons uh, in for example, in Austria, there is such a pilot program where uh, trucks are driving in a platoons of size of two vehicles. And uh, yeah, BISM now allows you to investigate the effects of uh, platooning uh, on, uh, on your infrastructure in the future, where there will be much more platoons. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, uh... I would like to again remind you that also past webinars um, are available on our YouTube channel. Um, like Peter well said, um, we had a webinar previously where the uh, initial um, functionalities for modeling uh, automated vehicles were presented. Now, uh, because we wanted to improve these uh, uh, tools that have been developed, um, there are some new uh, availability of functionalities that allow uh, the consideration of such promising um, characteristics such as forming platoons. And this is what uh, is being uh, mainly presented today, but please uh, also visit our previous webinars. And if you have any, any questions or comments, uh, feel free to contact us via the um, uh, website of the project. Um, and also you can see uh, now our, our contact details during this webinar. Um, let's take a couple of more questions before we go to our next presentation. Um, we have a question from uh, Fotaini Rufanu. Um, which parameters of the Wiedermann model were parameterized for developing the three AV models? Were additional parameters added for the development of these models? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me show that in Wissam. Yeah. So, this platooning and platooning parameters are new. What is new is also uh, this option here use implicit stochastic and enforce absolute breaking distance. So, these two features uh, are you you can use and for uh, following itself or for car following model uh, we proposed values for each driving behavior cautious normal and aggressive and actually we change almost all of them slightly uh, the normal one for example, is very similar to the conventional uh, driving uh, behavior parameter set, but cautious and aggressive, uh, there are more visible uh, changes. And uh, we did it not only for car following, we did it also for uh, lane change parameters. Um, but as I said, this is based mainly on assumptions. For car following parameters, we also have some empirical data and yeah that's that's the most uh, most important the parameters uh, under car following model and uh, lane change you can also have some change um, for signal control for example um, if the vehicle um, can recognize that they are approaching uh, signalized intersection and if you know that they will based on that information they will change uh, the behavior like uh, they will reduce the safety distance then you could put another factor as uh, as one and actually the default value for conventional vehicles here is lower than one because it was uh, um, uh, it was shown uh, in in, uh, in real traffic uh, that the vehicles are 
driving a little bit differently in when when they are close to to an intersection. So basically, we, we propose values for all parameters. Uh, you can find it in the uh, deliverables we prepared or in the in the guide we prepared. And there is a new tab and a few new features like enforced absolute breaking distance use implicit stochastic. And this field here in the car following model is new where you can set following uh, behavior depending on the vehicle class of the leading vehicle class. So you can have, uh, um, you can distinguish or you can for, for each combination uh, or for each pair of possible uh, vehicles in the traffic flow like AV following AV or AV following conventional vehicle or conventional vehicle following AV and so on. For each this combination, you can set uh, different parameters. Great, yes, thank you. Um... Okay, I think we have time for one more question during this session. Uh, the rest, no worries. We will have uh, another Q and A session by the end of the of the webinar, so we will save some questions for then. Uh, but let's take one last one. Um, okay, we have uh, here a question by Hisung An. Um, why did this? Uh, did you select the maximum number of vehicles in the platoon? to be eight vehicles. Do you happen to have a special reason for that? So, um, no, what it are was the limitations just, there? Or, mm -hmm. no, 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 it was just a demonstration example. And uh, you as a modeler can decide how many vehicles can uh, be in one platoon. Or you can investigate what would be the impact uh, of uh, platoon size. Uh, three or five or eight, if there will be some difference in uh, capacity or uh, in, uh, in travel time or delays or uh, some some other KPIs. So uh, mm -hmm. you as a modeler can set this value. And yeah, there were okay. some, you can, you can find some papers with some experimental trials uh, and I think uh, they deal with the platoons up to eight but in VSIM uh, you have uh, you, you have the freedom to, to set any value you you want to test exactly and I think it's important to remember that um, at least in, in in the functionality that we're seeing now the pl platoons cannot uh, change uh, lanes right and also there's no cut-ins in the middle of the platoon and so on. So it's it's uh, something to consider um, and to investigate how long would you like to allow a platoon to be in, what the effects on the congestion and the other um, uh, impacts on the, on, on the mobility are, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and maybe in reality, there will be some rules uh, platoons need uh, to follow, for example, they can form a long platoons between intersections, but uh, when they will be close to intersection, maybe they will need to dissolve uh, to in order to have a uh, bigger distances between vehicles to allow lane changing for other vehicles. Uh, they uh, which, which which want to. Uh, uh, go out from uh, from the motorway. So there, there might be different scenarios and you can test them all in VSIM. Perfect, thank you very much, Peter, for the interesting presentation. You're welcome. Um, so now I think before we go to York, uh, let's uh, have one more poll. Um, Sedrina, can we go to poll number three here? Um, we would like to okay. know what you think about these sort of tools um, and whether you foresee um, including CAVs in your city or your organization's traffic flow or travel demand modeling yeah. efforts in the near future. So this is, this is very simple, yes, no, or uh, I don't know, not applicable. OK, 
Okay, I see that almost half of the people have voted. All right, I'll keep it open for a couple more seconds. All right. Perfect. Okay, that's great to know that more than half of you do foresee using this sort of tools in the near future. Um, so hopefully this uh, webinar is going to be very useful for your uh, professional activities. Okay, thank you, Sidrina. Let's then uh, welcome York and hear from him on the macroscopic travel demand modeling tools. Thank you, Daniel. And hello everyone, I also want to welcome you to the next part of the webinar, which is on macroscopic travel demand modeling. My name is Jörg Sonnleitner and I'm a research assistant at the Chair for Transport Planning and Traffic Engineering, located at the University of Stuttgart. So the aim is to present methods to you uh, for macroscopic travel demand modeling. More precisely, we want to demonstrate how to modify existing travel demand models to include characteristics and impacts of highly automated vehicles. So we are not going to talk about the impacts of fully automated vehicles, but about those of highly automated ones. Within the project Coexist, we developed the tools presented today, and they, these are applied in macroscopic use cases in two of the project's partner cities, Gothenburg and Stuttgart. And for a demonstration, we will use a travel demand model for a simplified study area and show how the methods can be integrated step by step. This will be supported by the use of scripts. These are useful to prepare and build the model, but I will not use them to operate it. It's just faster and more comfortable and of course, I will explain what they do and all files used will be available for download. So you can have a more detailed look later. The link will be sent to all of you and can be found in the video description of the recording. We want to present three scenarios today. First one, S0, is our baseline scenario where we have no AV at all. Then we will introduce highly automated vehicles and include changes in traffic performance, scenario S1. And the last one, scenario S2, additionally incorporates changes in the perception of travel time. And our expectation is that we see impacts on both supply and demand side. In particular, we expect to see changes regarding travel times mode choice and destination and route choice. Now we will have a look at the model. So we see the network of a rural region close to Munich. So we see part of Munich on the bottom left. And for the traffic zones, there are bars displayed, which show the inhabitants, employed persons and working places for each zone. So this means that the structural data is already included in the model. Furthermore, we see the road network and the roads are classified by the roadway type. Um, so we have motorways and the bigger rural roads in yellow and the minor road network in black. And of course, we also have rail lines and public transport stops. The transport systems and modes available are um, conventional car, bus, train and walk. We have three modes, car driver, car passenger and public transport. 
and the same for the demand segments. But additionally, we have one demand segment for the through traffic, which is also using the transport system conventional car. We will also have a look at the procedure sequence. So first, an assignment is initialized. We will also initialize all the demand matrices. Then we have some steps to calculate skims for private and public transport. Some of these matrices are then set as an impedance for modes. Then we will have the calculation of the travel demand. It's a tour-based model, VSEM. So we will have trip generation and combined trip distribution and mode choice. Then we will have the private transport assignment. Travel times are updated. And then we will step back and um, we'll feedback this into the travel demand calculation again. So we have some steps which will run in the loop for three times. Afterwards, the final skin matrix calculation and public transport assignment. So we will run this procedure. And as the model is rather small, this will only take a few seconds. And we will have a look at the network and we can see that the network is loaded. So in dark green, we have the conventional cars, um, conventional car demand, which is calculated by the travel demand model. And the gray bars are the through traffic. So this over here is the static demand, which is not influenced by the travel demand model. So, we already prepared the indicators for this. And we have prepared three indicators. So on the left, the trip-based modal split. In the middle, the total distance traveled. And on the right, the time spent in the network. And these consider only the calculated demand. The through traffic is not included. And we can see that all three indicators are dominated by the car modes with a similar distribution. So we have around 54 to 55% car driver. We have 18 to 19% for car passenger and the rest for public transport. And these are our values for the baseline. So it will be interesting to see the results in comparison to the two other scenarios with AV. If we want to introduce highly automated vehicles, we have to make some changes to the model. So here's a general overview on what we are going to do and what we are going to see. So first, we need a new transport system with the name car AV. Then we will also have a new mode and new demand segment, with the same name, but this we will all only use for a specific skim calculation and we will not use it for mode choice. So conventional vehicles and highly automated vehicles are both part of the mode car driver. The AV share in the network is set by the user. We will have no changes regarding car availability and trip generation. Traffic performance is assumed to be influenced by automated vehicles. The same goes for travel time perception, but this is only considered in scenario S2. And if traffic performance is influenced, travel times will change, and this leads to changes in destination and mode choice. And the first thing we are going to do in Visum is to split the demand according to the AV share. So we will need two things for this, the AV share and the demand matrix for car driver. And what we are going to do is to multi multiply the respective share for the transport system with the total car driver demand. And this will give us a new demand matrix for conventional vehicles here. And the same with automated vehicles. So it's pretty straightforward. And the screenshot shows how this is implemented in Visum. So we will have two new formula demand matrices. So now we are going to do exactly that in Visum. So first we will 
run a script. The script adds a new transport system. So we now have automated car and we also have a new mode and demand segment for car AV. And the other thing that the script did for us is to insert two new user-defined attributes. So one is on the level of matrices. This is just a identifier for um, if we add formula matrices later, these will use this attribute. And the other one is our AV share on a network level. Then we will run another script. This will create those two new matrices for us. So one for the conventional car demand and one for the automated vehicle demand. And now we also have to include AV in our private transport assignment. So we will go to the assignment procedure and include AV driver. So now how are we going to include AV regarding traffic performance? So our main assumption is that AV perform differently than CV and to be able to account for that, we will use the passenger car unit concept. Passenger car units are a standardized unit for road capacity and traffic volumes. All vehicles need to be converted to passenger car units. So this is a common concept for macroscopic models. For example, one conventional passenger car corresponds naturally to one passenger car unit. A heavy duty vehicle corresponds to two passenger car units. And if we look now at AV in red, they could correspond to something different than one, for example, 0.8 passenger car units. We can also extend this concept to have different PCU values for different road roadway types, since we could assume that AV will perform differently on these different roadway types. For example, in Coexist, we classified um, three roadway types, motorway, arterial, and urban street. But of course, this depends on the model and input data you use. In Visum, we need a new volume delay function, which takes AV with this approach into account. So we will switch back to Visum and run another script. The script adds two new attributes to the model. Both are on the level of links. The first one is AV ready. This attribute can be either zero or one. Zero means that a link is considered to be not AV ready. One means that the link is AV ready. And if a link is AV ready, an automated vehicle is able to operate in automated mode. If it's not AV ready, travelers have to drive manually in their AV. And the other attribute is our PCU factor for the transport system AV. So we also want to be able to modify these parameters in our procedure sequence. So we will add procedure parameters and read them additionally to our procedure sequence. So I added a group of three procedures. First one sets the AV share. So we assume, for example, 50%. This is just for demonstration purposes. Then our PCU factor for all links in this case, but you can also define conditions if you like. And third one, which link is assumed to be AV ready or not. Here we um, use a if condition depending on the link type. And we can just execute this and have a look how we assumed this for this demonstration. So all links now with an additional green 
are assumed to be AV ready. These are the motorways and the bigger rural roads. All other roads are red, so travelers have to drive manually on these roads. And the rail is, of course, not considered at all for private transport. What we also need to do now is to add a new volume delay function. So we will go to general procedure settings, private transport settings, and links volume delay functions. What we see now is we have a standard BPR function set here, and this is used for all link types. And what we do what we want to do now is add a new one, which also takes AV into account. And we will choose a prepared user-defined volume delay function. This is working in the same way as a BPR function, with the difference that it is able to consider um, different PCU factors for AV. And if a link is AV ready, the value of our attribute is considered as this factor multiplied with the traffic volume. If a link is not AV ready, an AV will perform in the same way as a conventional vehicle and will have the passenger car unit of one. We also want the volume delay function to behave in the same way as the original one. So we will adopt the parameters of the old one and we'll set this new function for all link types. Confirm this. And then we are good to go and run the simulation again. Now we can have a look at the network. So the network is loaded again. We see the conventional cars in the dark green. And now we also have automated vehicles in turquoise. And what's now important to notice is that although we set an AV share for 50%, this only counts for the calculated demand. So as we can see here, um, because of the fruit traffic, we will not have an AV share of 50% on all links. So we will look again at our indicators. So we have a tiny increase in the trip-based modal split towards the car modes. And for distance traveled and time spent, we normalize the values to the base case to 100. So in the box above, we see the total changes. And the distance travel increases because on the one hand, we have a small modal shift towards the car modes. On the other hand, we will have changes in the destination choice. So we assumed AV to perform better than conventional vehicles. This means that travel times are decreasing and then travelers are able to reach further destinations within a similar travel time. So our distance traveled will increase. And with the given assumptions, um, time spent decreases to a small extent, although we have a higher mileage of the car modes, but um, AV improved traffic flow and reduce the travel times. So this is decreasing. So now another topic that also needs to be addressed is the perception of travel time. If you are free to spend your time on other things than driving, for example, reading a book, watching a movie, writing messages or something else, you will probably perceive the time in a different way. And um, this needs to be considered in travel demand modeling. So now it must be stressed that um, we are talking about highly automated vehicles. So they are still a transport system of the mode car driver but they will influence the attractiveness of this mode. Our assumption for modeling is now that perceived travel time corresponds to the travel time in automated mode reduced by 
this is just an assumption but from us, but it's inspired by values from literature and studies. So if you have a look, you will find state preference or revealed choices surveys on that. So the question is now, how do we implement this in the model? I will explain the concept with this simple example. So we see one origin destination pair and we have run route one route connecting these zones. The roadway types are urban, the first and the last road stretch, and motorway in between. And the actual travel time is 5, 20, and 5 minutes. And it's perceived in the same way in a conventional vehicle. So our factor for perception in a CV is 1. If we now imagine a motorway to be AV ready, since it's a simpler road environment and easier to handle for a highly automated vehicle, now you are able to spend um, this time on non-driving tasks. So the 20 minutes will be perceived differently. And with our assumption that it is reduced by 30%, we will have a reduction in the perceived travel time. So we will have 24 minutes in comparison to 30 minutes for a conventional vehicle. And for the mode car driver now, we have to combine both according to the AV share, weighted with the AV share. So in the end, these 27 minutes are used as one part of the impedance for mode choice. So we will do this now in Visum, we will run another script. The script again creates user defined attributes for us. One is the um, travel time, which is AV ready, so the automated travel time. This is a formula attribute. We will have a quick look at the formula. So basically, this attribute just adopts the current travel time for AV if the link is AV ready. And we will use this attribute later for a user defined skim calculation. The other attribute we added is our factor for the perception in the in vehicle for the in vehicle time in automated vehicles. So now we will add additional procedures. So we want to be able to modify this factor in a comfortable way. So we will add a step here. So we can change this if we like to. I leave it at 0.7 as in the slide. And we will add another step for the user defined skin calculation. We will also read this additionally. And so this step is just conducting a user-defined skin calculation for AV. And we will now have to define what this calculation really does for us. So we go to calculate general procedure settings again to skins. Now we see in row 13, we have the user-defined skin. We can give it a name. And below here, we have to define the parameters for the skin. And we want to include on the link level the attribute we just saw, so our automated travel time is considered here. This attribute um, uses seconds as a unit, so we will divide it by 60 because we need to have the skin matrix in minutes, as you can see here. We confirm this. And if we now run this procedure and have a look at the skin matrices, we see that Visum created a new skin matrix for us with the name we gave it. And what's included here is the average automated travel time on origin destination pair level. And now we 
will run one last script. The script creates three new, new formula matrices for us. I will not go into detail, but if you remember the simple example, these matrices just include parts of the total perceived travel time for both modes. So in the end, this is our final matrix for the perceived travel time for the mode car driver, combining the perceived travel times for conventional vehicles and automated vehicles. Now, the last thing we need to do is to set this as a new matrix for the impedance for the mode car driver. And now we will run the simulation again. We deserve the break, lean back, watch Resume do the work for us. Now, as we can see the network, the network is loaded again. So we have new assignment results ready. And we already prepared the indicators. So what we see now are similar trends as before regarding the share of car modes. But these are intensified by the assumptions on the perception of travel time we made. So the trip share increases. And yeah, the car modes seem to be more attractive now. This on the one hand leads to bigger shares of the car modes on the other two indicators. And on the other hand, the perceived time savings lead to a different destination and route choice. So this results in an increase in distance traveled. And also do travelers spend now longer time in their cars, but people do not perceive this time as negatively as without AV, since they are able to spend some of the traveling time on other tasks than driving. To conclude now, on top, we have the technological development. So the automation level of vehicles will increase by time. This leads to cars that will become better and better and more attractive to us. The objective is that we want to understand the impacts on travel demand. So what is going to happen when highly automated vehicles are introduced? One solution is that we should extend existing travel demand models. So we need to supplement the models we already have and use today with the methods presented. So these methods enable models to show the impacts of automated vehicles on travel demand by permitting to analyze assumptions on traffic performance and travel time perception. And these methods only require rather small modifications of existing models. And with this, I would like to finish the demonstration and presentation. Thank you very much for your interest and your attention. And if we want to have a deeper look into the implementation, um, as a reminder, a download link covering all files used today will be distributed. And now we will have time for questions. Exactly, thank you very much, Jörg. This was a very complete and comp uh, interesting presentation. Um, as you just mentioned, uh, we will send a link where you can download uh, all these examples. This is going to arrive uh, each uh, participant tomorrow within the follow-up um, email. Um, you will also receive a link where you can watch the, the video recorded and uh, a short a survey uh, for, for your evaluation of the webinar which we would very much appreciate if you can uh, take uh, a couple minutes to, to reply to. Um, okay, now we can take a couple of questions. Uh, let's see here, we have one question from Sakir Faramant. Um, is it possible to include spatial reference in this model for trip generation and attraction, such as a postal code? Mm. I'm not sure if I really understand the question, but um, maybe 
Yeah. Um, would Would you like to uh, clarify your question, so, Shakira? We can so maybe, uh, allow you to. Maybe I can say something about trip generation. Yeah. So, um, with the examples or the scenarios presented right now, we do not assume any changes in trip generation. So, um, we don't assume that new trips will be generated because these AV are only considered to be highly automated vehicle vehicles. So at that point where you will model, you want to model fully automated vehicles, then uh, this will have, this will change because then um, people without driving license um, are able to, to also conduct trips with these vehicles. But for this um, example, we do not consider any changes in trip generation. So the idea is that you plug in it to any existing travel demand model and whether you um, code the postcode, this doesn't matter. If you do it in your normal travel demand model, you can keep it. So it's not about how to develop a travel demand model, it's about how to extend an existing travel demand model to include features of automated vehicles. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, he would also like to know um, your opinion on including AV shared in the model as he's currently doing some research on car sharing. So the AV share as presented is a user input between zero and 100%. So this just sets um, how you are going to split your original demand for car drivers. So your vehicle fleet will just be split and it will be applied, the share will be applied on all origin destination relations in the same way. So you can experiment by varying it and it's not about car sharing, it's about the share of cars which have this specific ability of private non-sharing cars which have AV capabilities. So they mean they use the capacity in a different way. And if you use it as a private driver, um, you have a different perception of travel time because you can do other things. Great, thank you very much. We have uh, one question for Peter um, now. Um, can the simulation be used for conventional vehicles? Uh, here, I want to understand that um, the the person is uh, referring to platooning. Uh, of course, I mean platooning by design is um, uh, available only for automated vehicles. Um, yes, that's uh, that's right. But in Wism, you can have a mix of conventional vehicles and automated vehicles, and you can have uh, different types of uh, automated vehicles. So you can have a mix of, uh, let's say, 60% uh, of conventional vehicles and 20% of uh, automated vehicles with uh, cautious driving behavior and 20% of vehicles with uh, normal uh, driving uh, behavior or any other uh, mix of uh, your choice. You just uh, need to make sure that your conventional vehicles uh, are in a vehicle class which is using uh, the driving behavior uh, for conventional vehicles. And the automated vehicles are using another driving behavior which is uh, set for automated vehicles and for example they are also allowed to form platooning. Perfect, great. Thanks for the clarification. Um, see, we have a question from Eloisa Macero for Jörg. Um, is it possible to increase road capacity instead of changing the PCU for simulating CAVs? Yes, this is also possible. It's then, yeah, a different approach, but I mean, if you, if you know how many AVs you have and how their impact is, you can leave the PCUs uh, as they are and um, change capacity. But the approach presented is quite flexible. So if you're not really sure how many AVs you are going to have on each link, um, 
it's it's easier just to say how one AV performs and how much capacity it, it claims or it needs. And if you have no AV at all, of course, nothing changes, even if you use the new volume delay function presented. Uh, but yeah, it's it's in general, it's also possible. It's an attribute, you can modify it as you like, if you have good reason to do so. Great, thank you. Um, okay, now before we take some more questions, let's just have one final poll. Um, so, uh, Serena, if we can launch the final question. Uh, here we want to know your opinion on, on the impacts of, of automated mobility in the future. Do you think it's going to improve your city's mobility and uh, it's going to support sustainability goals? All right, okay. folks are coming in slowly. I'll leave it open for just a couple more seconds. All right. Great, thank you. So as we can see, around half the people believe that it is in fact going to improve urban mobility. But of course, there's a lot of uncertainty about this topic. Uh, so about 30% uh, can't really tell. And also this is why um, Coexist is trying to fill in these gaps of uh, um, methodologies and tools that might allow um, us to try to handle these uncertainties and get a better grasp on what uh, might happen in the future and be able to address it on time. Thank you, Sidrina. Then uh, let's see if we can take a couple of more questions before the webinar is done. Um, so uh, we have a question um, by Fotaini Orfanu. So are the deliverables referring to, to the microscopic and macroscopic models presented in the webinar public? Um, and here we can say yes, we have uh, various deliverables uh, on not only how uh, these tools can be used, so the user guides, but also the uh, development process, how they were calibrated and validated and um, implemented within Coexist. They can be found in Coexist uh, website under resources. And uh, if you have any, any doubts about them, feel free to contact us through the contact option there. I would like to add uh, one information that uh, there is a guide for uh, AV modeling and this one will be updated soon because uh, platooning is not inside yet, but all the other features are. Thank you, yeah, this is very important to clarify. Um, through the project, there's been advancements in, in the tools, so, by the end of the project in April 2020, we will have all um, final deliverables available in our website. Yeah, thank you. So um, do we have any more questions? Also remember that you can raise your hand and briefly pose a question. Okay, and as a follow-up question on, on the last one we just took, um, Sophia Sharon Pidu is asking whether this guide is part of the deliverables of the project, the one you just mentioned, Peter? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, yes, exactly. 
Okay. Um, I think we just reached the hour 30 minutes. Um, so as no other questions are coming in, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you for the speakers, for the great presentations. We're very happy that today we reached a very large audience. Uh, for a moment, we had over 90 uh, attendees. Um, it's great to, to see this amount of interest out there. Uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I hope you follow up on Coexist results and updates in our next event. Thank you very much and have a great day. Okay. Um.